In this lecture, you'll learn about broadcast domains and failover groups, which work together to ensure that if a physical port goes down, clients still have access to their logical interface and IP address on the NetApp storage system. Just to clarify again, that failover is for NAS protocols only. For your SAN protocols, they support multipath. The client already knows about the different IP addresses that it can connect on. And if a port goes down and that IP address goes down, the client will connect on one of the other IP addresses. So that is already built into the SAN protocol. We do not need our logical interfaces to fail over for SAN protocols, so failover groups do not apply to SAN. But for our NAS protocols, the NAS client only knows about one IP address that it connects on. So if the underlying physical port that the logical interface is on that has got that IP address, if it goes down, then we need to move that logical interface to another physical port so that the IP address will stay up and the client can still connect to the storage. So looking at the example here, we've got a host which is connecting in on a logical interface with IP address 10.10.30.10. And if the port that that logical interface is on goes down, then it will fail over to another port. And it could either fail over to the port over here on the right. So the lift moves over there. It takes its IP address, 10.10.30.10. Or it could fail over to this port here. Again, it takes its IP address, 10.10.30.10. Or the lift could fail over onto this port here. When that happens, the switch will learn that the logical interface has moved to the other port. The host still just keeps connecting to the same IP address. It's completely transparent to the host. The host does not know that anything happened. But there is a potential problem with this. So looking at the networks that we've got on our ONTAP cluster, we have got the cluster network, which is used for traffic going between the nodes themselves. And the cluster network is on a closed private network. You have to put in dedicated switches for this. Those switches are not connected out to the rest of the network. So the only connectivity to the cluster network is on the cluster network. It doesn't go out anywhere else. We've also got the management network used for our management connections coming into the cluster. Like when you connect to the command line or system manager, that's going to be coming in over the management network. And we've also got the data network for our client access protocols. So these are three separate networks and they're going to have separate connectivity as well. Like you see, we've got a client out here, which is connecting into our NAS logical interface of 10.10.10.10 for this example. It's coming in over the data network and hitting a port, obviously, that's connected to the data network as well. Then let's say that the port goes down, that the lift is on. So the lift now needs to move to another port so that the client will continue to have access. But maybe the lift migrates over to this port here, which is on the cluster network, which is a separate private network. Well, the client does not have connectivity to that port over there. So if the lift moves over to a port in the cluster network or in the management network, then the client is going to lose connectivity to that IP address. So we have to make sure that that does not happen. When the lift moves because of a failure, we need to make sure that it moves to another physical port that the client has still got connectivity to. So it's critical to ensure that if a lift fails over to another physical port or interface group or VLAN interface, that clients still have connectivity to that lift and its IP address. Physical ports and interface group or VLAN ports with the same connectivity, meaning they're in the same layer two network, should be placed in the same broadcast domain. So it's broadcast domains that we configure to control this. 
failover groups are automatically set up on the NetApp system based on your broadcast domains. You specify a home node and port when you create a lift, and a NAS lift can only fail over to another port in the same broadcast domain. This ensures clients still have connectivity to it in the event of a failover. So let's go back to our picture here again to see how it's going to work now. So for the cluster network, we have a cluster broadcast domain. And it's the two ports that are connected to the cluster network. They go into the cluster broadcast domain. So now if there's a lift on either one of these ports and that port goes down, the lift can fail over to the other port and we've still got the same connectivity there. We're next going to have a broadcast domain for the management network and the two physical ports in our example that are connected to the management network will be put into the management broadcast domain. So again, if either one of the ports goes down, then lifts there can fail over to the other port, which is in the same broadcast domain, same connectivity, so clients will still have access to the lift. And finally, for our example, we've also got a data broadcast domain, and it's going to be our two ports here in the example that are connected to the data network. They go into the data broadcast domain. So now what happens is we've got our NAS lift with IP address 10.10.10.10, our client out on the network, which has got connectivity through the data network to that NAS lift, and then... Let's say that the port here that the lift is on goes down. So what's going to happen is the lift will fail over to another port in the same broadcast domain. So it fails over here. The client has still got connectivity to that physical port, so it can still get to its IP address and it can still reach its data. So that's why we create the broadcast domains to make sure that if a lift fails over, it's always going to fail over to another port with the same connectivity. So we create our broadcast domain. We also have the failover group as well, which is associated with the broadcast domain. A failover group is created automatically each time a broadcast domain is created. And the name of the failover group is set as the same as the broadcast domain. So you may be thinking, well, why do we have broadcast domains and failover groups as well? Well, the history of this is that failover groups were available a long time ago. Broadcast domains are a newer thing because a situation could occur where an administrator deployed a NetApp storage system and they just left everything at the default and everything would be working fine when they first set it up. But then when a port did go down, a lift would fail over to the wrong port because of the way the failover groups were set up. And the first time that anybody would know that there was an issue was when there was an actual outage. Obviously, we don't want that to happen. We don't want to have when there is an outage that clients can't reach their data. We want them to still be able to get to their data. So in ONTAP 8.3, broadcast domains came out. Broadcast domains are more intuitive to configure than failover groups. Basically, when you're setting up your system and you're setting up your networking, you pretty much have to set up your broadcast domains. So that makes it much less likely that there will be an issue with the networking where if a port goes down, that clients cannot get to their data. So broadcast domains, they were a newer feature. They're very closely tied with the failover groups, but it makes it easier for you, the administrator, to set up your networking and make sure you don't have any issues if there is any outages. So we're gonna have our broadcast domains and our failover groups, and a port can be assigned to only one broadcast domain. When using interface groups, add the member ports, so add the physical ports that are the members of that interface group to the correct broadcast domain first, and then add the interface group to the broadcast domain as well. As ports are added to or removed from the broadcast domain, the same operation is performed on the associated failover group. So they're kept in sync with each other. The ports in the broadcast domain mirror the ports of the failover group. And again, failover groups only apply to NAS protocols. SAN protocols have got multipathing, so they do not need failover. So failover groups do not apply to SAN lifts. 
Okay, let's look at the relationship between our broadcast domain and the IP space. Broadcast domain resides in an IP space. Your ports are added to the broadcast domain, not the IP space, and there's a matching failover group for every broadcast domain, as we just spoke about on the last slide. So looking at our IP spaces again, which was covered in the earlier lecture, the reason we would create an IP space is if we need to support duplicate IP addresses on the cluster. You can see we're doing that here. We have got an SVM, which has got a lift with IP address 10.1.1.10. And we also need to support that same IP address 10.1.1.10 on another lift for another SVM. To do that, we need to put them in separate IP spaces. So we've got IP space A and we've got IP space B. And then our broadcast domains go into our IP spaces. The physical ports or interface, interface groups or the VLAN interfaces, they get attached to the broadcast domain. During cluster initialization, the system creates two default IP spaces, broadcast domains and failover groups. We've got the default broadcast domain that contains ports that are in the default IP space and all data and management ports are in the default broadcast domain by default. We also have the cluster broadcast domain containing ports that are in the cluster IP space and all cluster ports are in the cluster broadcast domain by default. So maybe you've picked up on a potential issue here already is that all data and management ports are in the default broadcast domain by default. Well, we're going to have at least probably a, a data network and a management network. They're going to have different connectivity, but by default, they both go in the same broadcast domain. So we're going to have to change that. At the very least, we're going to have separate broadcast domains for data and for management. And quite likely, we're going to have multiple different broadcast domains for our different data networks. The cluster broadcast domain, that's fine. That's that separate dedicated network for the cluster network. We can leave that as it is. If you have physical ports with different layer two connectivity, then create separate physical domains for each network, such as the data network and the management network. Different layer two connectivity means that the logical interfaces are connected to physically separated networks or ports on shared switches with different VLANs. So for example, if you've got a physical port on your NetApp system, which is connected to a switch, and on that switch port, it is supporting VLAN 10. And then you've got another physical port on the NetApp system connecting to another port, could be on the same switch, and that switch port is supporting VLAN 20. Well, two different VLANs means two different layer two networks. So those two ports need to go in different broadcast domains. If you've got a logical interface on that first port, which was connected to VLAN 10, and it fails over to another port, which is connected to VLAN 20, that's going to break connectivity. Your clients will not be able to connect to that IP address. So anytime you've got a physical interface on the NetApp system, which is connecting to networks that are physically separated or are in different VLANs, that goes into a different broadcast domain. If you've got two ports, on the NetApp system that are connecting to ports on the switch that support the same VLANs, then they go into the same broadcast domain. So a typical configuration would be having separate broadcast domains for department A, another one for department B, another one for management, and another one for the cluster network. Any broadcast domains that you create will be members of the default IP space by default. And you can just leave it like that unless you need to support duplicate IP addresses on the same cluster. If two SVMs need to use the same IP address, then use two different broadcast domains in two different IP spaces. Another thing we can do is custom failover groups. So by default, you've got that just static one-to-one -one relationship, well, really dynamic one-to-one -one relationship between a broadcast domain and a failover group. It's dynamic because if you make any changes to the broadcast domain, that will be reflected in the failover group as well. And typically, you can just leave everything set at the defaults for how your failover groups are set up. 
but you may also want to ensure that lifts fail over to a port with the same speed setting so clients will continue to get the same performance. So for example, you might have two physical ports which are connected to the same layer two network, meaning they are connected to switch ports which support the same VLANs, but maybe one port is 10 gigabit ethernet and another port is one gigabit ethernet. Well, in that case, you're not gonna want any lifts on the 10 gigabit ethernet port to fail over to the one gigabit ethernet port. So how you can control that, you can either put them in separate broadcast domains or you could create a custom failover group within one broadcast domain to make sure that your lifts will not fail over to a slower speed interface. Another reason for custom failover groups is if you want a lift to fail over to only a subset of the ports in a broadcast domain. That's basically really the same thing there anyway. You can configure the members of a failover group and the failover policy. Okay, last thing to tell you about here is what the failover policies are. So first one is broadcast domain wide. With this, the lift fails over a port in the same broadcast domain as the home port. That includes all ports from all nodes in the failover group. And this is the default for the cluster management lift. So we are going to create a management broadcast domain and the cluster management lift is going to be in there. All ports connected to the management network are going to be in that broadcast domain. And if a physical port fails that the cluster management lift is on, it will fail over to any of the other management physical ports, either on the same node or on a different node. So that's the default. And really that is how we want it to be set up. So we're not going to change that. The next one is system defined. With the system defined failover policy, the lift fails over to a port on the home node or a non-HA partner only. So this is the default for data lifts for our normal client NAS access. The reason that it fails over to a port on the home node or a non-HA partner only is that during upgrades, obviously there's going to be an outage as the nodes are coming up and down. So we want to keep the failover that occurs during the upgrade off of the HA pair. So with this, if you do have a port fails, it's going to fail over to another port in the same broadcast domain, apart from on the HA partner. And again, this is what we want to occur for our data lifts. So again, we're not going to change the default failover policy. And the next one is local only. With local only, the lift fails over to a port on the home node of the lift only. So it's going to stay on the same node. This is the default for cluster lifts, for node management lifts, and for inter-cluster lifts. Each of those lift types are specific to a particular node, so we have to make sure that they do not leave that particular node. So again, the default here is what we want to happen anyway. We're not going to change it. The last couple of failover policies we're not going to actually use typically. That's SFO partner only. Here, the lift fails over to the port on the home node or SFO partner only. This is not the default for anything because typically we don't want to use it. And the last one is disabled, where failover is disabled for the lift. Again, we're not typically going to want that to happen. We want if a lift, if the underlying port goes down, we want the lift to fail over to another port so the IP address still remains available. So you can see the three that are actually used, the three that are actually the default. Those are the defaults anyway. Typically, there's not a good reason to change them. So when you're setting this up, you do need to set up the broadcast domains, but the failover policies you can typically leave as is. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.